Thank you for uh, tuning in to Conversations with Jennifer. Jennifer's an estate planning attorney. And today we're going to carry on our conversation from last week, which we talked about healthcare directives. If you haven't uh, watched that video, please do. A lot of good information in there. But today we're talking about power of attorneys. So what is a power of attorney document? Um, so a power of attorney is essentially an estate planning document where an individual can list one or more in other individuals um, to take on certain um, activities or powers um, that that individual uh, does in his or her individual capacity. So, um, so oftentimes uh, people will have them uh, to help with um, dealing with bank accounts or um, dealing with bill paying. Um, it used to be the sort of document where um, when we had a trust in place, um, estate planning attorneys thought, well, we don't really need this other document because everything's going to be moved into the trust. That was always kind of the goal with estate planning. However, these days um, we see financial powers of attorney um, becoming more and more important um, because you will have assets that are outside of your trust. Um, perfect examples are retirement accounts, which I know we've talked about before, Amar. Yeah. Um, life insurance policies. Um, you'll just hold that in your individual name sometimes. Um, also dealing with other matters like um, government benefits, um, filing your personal income tax returns. That's something that we can't move into the trust, um, but it's very important as far as what if something happens to you and you need someone to step in and continue with your financial affairs. Also, moving assets into the trust. That's another great example of why you may want a power of attorney in place. And we'll generally see these a couple different ways. One is you have a very broad general power of attorney, um, meaning I just want to give this person any number or basically any of my powers that I can do in my individual capacity that has to do with my property management or my finances. Um, you can also we also see them where they're limited. You may say, I only want this person to have certain powers. I want them to be able to transfer assets into my trust or file income tax returns for me. But I don't want it to be really, really broad. I want it to be limited. So we'll see them both ways. Um, we'll also see the powers either immediately effective, meaning as soon as you sign that document, um, that agent who you've appointed uh, can, can deal with your financial assets um, and management immediately. Um, the other way we see it is uh, referenced as a springing power, meaning it only comes into effect once um, some action or condition has been met. And it's typically I've become incapacitated, either determined by one, two physicians, physician and a family member, all sorts of different varieties on that. But it, the power only becomes effective once that condition has been met. So it springs into effect. Um, I will say in my practice, I generally make powers of attorney uh, immediately effective for financial matters. Um, and there's a couple of different reasons for that. We always talk to clients about the difference, um, but I'd say for the most part, we want your financial well-being and your financial day-to-day -day activities to continue without having to deal with a third party and what their determination or requirements for capacity or incapacity are. Um, and so we say, let's not even deal with that and let's just make it immediately effective, but obviously appoint someone who you trust um, in that <laughs> capacity. Um, I have some clients who are like, why would I want to give that person this power? And I'm like, well, I think the better question is, is why are you even thinking about giving this person this power? That's a great point. Yeah. <laughs> so let's talk about what makes a good power of attorney. Um, I think that would be a good, perfect segue into that piece of the conversation. Yeah. So again, it's someone who you trust, um, someone who um, handles their own financial matters well. Um, I will say it's typically if you have kind of a, a, you know, a general estate plan in place, a trust, a will and a financial power of attorney, it tends to be the same people in all three of those documents as a successor trustee on your trust 
as an executor in your will and as your attorney, in fact, on a financial power of attorney. Because you really want the same person managing and controlling your assets across the board. And so that's, again, why I kind of, you know, I, um, I ask the next important question is if you're uncomfortable with this person having this power, then they're maybe not the right person to be listed as your successor <laughs> trustee or your executor um, on these documents. So the, yeah. the better question is, is who, you know, what are your concerns about this person? And yeah. let's discuss that. And is there maybe someone else? I will say um, sometimes with clients of mine, and we've talked about this in the past when we've talked about trustees, have listed um, corporate trustees. They've listed banks or trust companies. Banks and trust companies will not act on a financial power of attorney. They will not be named. Um, and you'll still see them named in documents here and there, but they will not fulfill that, um, that role. That is more of a personal role that the banks and trust companies are generally not uh, not wi not willing to take on. Same with the healthcare directive. They're not going to be making medical decisions for any individuals. They really just want to be on the trust side um, or, you know, executor of a will. And even sometimes they don't even want to do that. So if you have a corporate trustee in place, you'll also need to think about an individual who can fulfill the role on the financial power of attorney. Yeah, no, that's a very good point. Um, and I think, you know, most of us may have a trust document and may have a power of attorney. I, I, I want to just bring up an example um, here that I was working with a client whose uh, husband went into long-term care mm -hmm. and they owned an annuity and the annuity had a long-term care writer, right? Mm -hmm. I said, great, let's, let's access those funds into the annuity and then we can move forward. Yeah. So, we're going through their binder. We find their power of attorney document and it was blank. Oh. It wasn't even filled out. Yeah. And so remember the annuity was in an individual ownership. It wasn't in the trust. It had the writer to pay for the long-term care uh, costs that they were going through, but they had a blank document. And right. So I think one of the things that we should kind of put out there to, in the universe is that go look at your power of attorney document and, uh, actually call Jennifer or myself and let's actually review it to make sure that you have the right people, the right, you know, version of this document. I think, as you mentioned earlier before, if you have a trust dated 1970 something <laughs> or something really older that those original documents didn't have a uh, power of attorney and I bet some of the languaging has changed. Uh, and maybe the people that you have listed today, they're maybe the same age as you and maybe not the appropriate person or may have already passed as well. So thank you for watching. Uh, please hit the like button. It helps other people find this type of content. And please reach out to Jennifer and myself to help review your documents to make sure that you're in the right place in your estate planning uh, journey. Thanks. Thank you, Jennifer. Thanks.